explorers, adventurers, scientists, the ones who always broadened our horizons. We were at their side when they reached the deepest point in the oceans, the highest summits of the Earth and both poles. We may think we've seen it all, that the world has its limits after all. But why do explorers, adventurers, scientists continue to venture out there again and again? Certainly not just for the record. So what do they seek, really? To understand more intimately how complex and delicate our planet is. To document its change and how we can affect it for the better. As long as they need it, we will be at their side. Because today, the real discovery is not so much about finding new lands. It's about looking with new eyes at the marvels of our planet, rekindling our sense of wonder and acting here and now to preserve this pale blue dot and make it perpetual. trees, do what we can to protect forests, uh, try and do something about the pollution of the ocean, and generally think about the consequences of the little things we buy and choose to do each day. You know, where did they come from? Did it harm the environment? Did it lead to cruelty to animals? And all of this ties together. So we're harming the planet in so many ways, and the result of that is these very frightening changes in climate. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Libby Casey, politics and accountability anchor at the Washington Post. Our program today is part of our Climate Solutions series, where we talk with scientists, conservationists, and other high profile advocates about how governments and individuals around the world are tackling the climate crisis. My first guest is Dr. Jane Goodall, founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and the United Nations Messenger of Peace. Dr. Goodall, welcome to Washington Post Live. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I want to talk about the extinction crisis that's facing our planet, but first, let's discuss the even bigger picture. Last month, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released their landmark report that showed humans have altered the environment at such an unprecedented pace that catastrophic climate impacts lie ahead unless the greenhouse gas pollution dramatically falls. So we're going to see the world leaders meet at the COP20 summit in November. What actions do they need to take on this? Uh, well, I, I hope very much that they will agree to curb their emissions. I hope there will be some agreement about protecting forests and the environment. And I hope that the summit will be followed by action and that it isn't just mere words. What would that action look like to you? Well, at the Paris Accord, governments made commitments uh, as to how much emission they would curb, but they didn't stick to that and there was nothing to require them to stick to it. So those that looked as though maybe they had managed were the companies that sent their really dirty industry overseas. Back then it was to India and China. Uh, so that it looked as though from their country, 
much fewer emissions were going out into the atmosphere. But, you know, you mentioned earlier that if we don't curb emissions, we'll have catastrophic results. We're having catastrophic results already everywhere. The effects of climate change and loss of biodiversity are seen in all parts of the world. Another pledge that countries have made is that the rich countries would uh, have at least a billion dollars a year uh, by 2020 that would go to developing nations to help cut carbon emissions, but but the targets not being met. So how uh, do they need to deliver on their promises? Well, you know, I'm, <laughs> I can't really answer that because that isn't my field of, of expertise. But how do they do it? They make a commitment and stick to it, and they allocate the required amount in their budget to help the poorer countries to control their emissions. But, uh, you know, more than that, I can't say. Mm. Uh, you, you make it sound very doable. Set the target hit the target, meet the target. You know, Dr. Goodall, we are seeing how interconnected we all are globally. Um, climate change shows us that. The coronavirus pandemic shows us that. How do you think about the causes you're working towards on the global level and also on the local level? I think a lot of people lose hope, feel helpless and hopeless because we have this saying, think globally, act locally. But quite honestly, the news these days is so full of doom and gloom, you can't avoid it. It's in television, it's in print, it's everywhere. And so people feel, what can I do? I'm one person. So they do nothing. However, I always tell these people, you know, look around where you are, your own community, where you live, what do you care about? And then set to work, roll up your sleeves and start tackling that one thing which you can do something about. And what happens then is that if you make a difference, say you're cleaning a little stream of litter with your friends and the stream starts running clean, and that may mean that you have to go upstream and talk to the people who are doing the pollution. But if you succeed, then you feel full of hope and you do more and you then Hope is contagious, so you inspire more people to do more. And this is a circular thing which ends up with more people doing more to help the environment. And then, then you dare think globally when you realize that it's not just you, it's all around the globe. There are people who've woken up and the media has woken us up. I mean, nobody can avoid, anybody who can read or listen can avoid hearing about the doom and gloom. But you know, what I want to happen is the media gives more time to all the amazing and wonderful stories that are going on around the world. The people who are protecting forests, which of course helps to uh, protect the CO2 that the forests, the leaves, the trunks and the soil have absorbed from the atmosphere. And if you protect the forest, you prevent it uh, spilling back into the environment, which of course happens with all these terrifying fires that are going on all over the world. Shh, terrible, terrible fires. You know, for decades you've been on uh, what the Jane Goodall Institute describes as a perpetual world tour to share your messages of hope and conservation. But the pandemic really stopped your travel just like it, it stopped so much of our lives. But you found new ways to deliver that message of hope, including a podcast that you call a hope cast. What has this time at home meant for you? What have you been able to do? Well, you know, at first I was really frustrated and angry, but fortunately when the pandemic began closing things down, I was here. This is the house I grew up in. Um, it's where I survived World War II. And I think going through World War II when things seemed so hopeless, when Britain alone for quite a long time stood against the might of Nazi Germany, and the rest of Europe was either defeated or they capitulated. And this was before Churchill persuaded Roosevelt to join in the war. And we did manage to defeat Nazi Germany and Europe wasn't overrun forever and ever. So I think that that gave me this, this feeling of hope. But, you know, today 
um, stuck here in the house I grew up in, I thought, well, it's no good feeling frustrated and angry. So with a little team from the Jane Goodall Institute, Mary Lewis here and Dan Dupont in, in the US, we created Virtual Jane. And it's it's been tough, but the positive side is that I've reached millions more people in many more countries. But you know, it's been every single day since the pandemic started that I've been sitting here behind this screen doing Zooms and Skypes and podcasts. And you mentioned the Hopecast. Well, that's bringing people uh, in as guests who have a positive outlook on life because it's this positive outlook, the fact we know what to do and if we only will get together, we can do it. So the Hopecast is really loved by so many people. It shot up to the uh, into the top 10% of podcasts watched around the world, which is to me amazing. But anyway, it happened. <laughs> Let's talk about another one of your efforts. The Jane Goodall Institute has an educational program for young people called Roots and Shoots. And we are seeing a new generation of, of young climate activists on the front lines. How do you see their work fitting into the conservation movement and, and how are they bringing about change? Well, uh, the Roots and Shoots program began back in 1991 because then I was traveling all around the world and everywhere I was meeting young people who seem to have lost hope. And a lot of them were really depressed. A lot of them were angry, some of them violent. And most of them were just apathetic. It doesn't seem to matter. We don't care what happens. And I began talking to them. They all said more or less the same. We feel like this because you've compromised our future, not me personally, but older generations. And there's nothing we can do about it. We've been compromising their future, stealing their future for years and years and years, probably ever since the Industrial Revolution or even before with the Agricultural Revolution. But was it too late? Was it true that there was nothing they could do? No, I'm convinced there's a window of time when we can start to slow down climate change and start healing some of the harm that we've inflicted but it's a but but we've got to get together and take action now these young people they are choosing projects to make the world better the main message is every single individual every one of us everybody listening we make some impact on the planet every single day and we get to choose what sort of impact we make, what we buy, what we wear, where did it come from? How was it made? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? That sort of thing. And because everything's interconnected, which I learned in the rainforest, then every group chooses and they choose three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And what began with 12 high school students is now in more than 65 countries. It has kindergarten, university, everything in between, beginning to get the staff of, of businesses and corporations. We're even in some prisons and retirement homes. And it's taking action. So what are they doing? They're changing the world as we speak. They're planting trees. They're growing organic food. They're writing letters. They're cleaning streams, they're collecting litter, they're raising money for the homeless, for those who are displaced as climate refugees or political refugees. They're, they're taking action everywhere. Do you worry that this generation of both children and adults is losing touch with nature? That is one of the main problems and people are forgetting and it, it's because so many people now live in the cities surrounded by concrete and they're forgetting that wherever you live you're part of the natural world and we depend on it if wherever we live we depend on it for clean air for oxygen for clean water we depend on the rainforests and the oceans to create rain to absorb carbon dioxide uh, and we depend on the natural world for everything, food and shelter. And, you know, people really need to reconnect with nature. And that's one of the things 
we try to do with our Roots and Shoots program, as well as taking nature into the city with urban greening and living green walls and giving children as much as possible the chance to be out in nature. So Dr. Goodall, you have lived on this planet for 87 years and you've seen some of the best of humanity, you've seen some of the worst of humanity, you've seen ice melt in the Arctic, you've seen forests destroyed and sea levels rise and species even disappear. And now this global pandemic. Have you seen a shift during the pandemic of people understanding or acting on the urgency of this moment? I think it has really woken people up. Um, I think climate change has woken many people up too. And so, you know, as far as during the pandemic, I think people living in some of the big mega cities probably saw the stars shining brightly in the night sky for the very first time instead of through a haze of smog and breathe clean air. What a luxury for some people. And although as soon as possible, it goes back to business as usual, people understand how it can be, how it should be. Mm. Well, we saw in the video at the beginning of our program that wildlife populations have decreased by almost 70% in the last 40 years. What do we stand to lose as animal populations decrease and species could disappear? Well, as I said earlier, um, we depend on the natural world uh, for, for everything, but what we depend on is healthy ecosystems. And it was when I was in the forest ecosystem of Gombe studying chimps that I came to understand how every plant and animal that was part of that ecosystem had a role to play, no matter how small it was. And I came to see this forest ecosystem as like a beautiful living tapestry of life. And so imagine as one little species disappears, it doesn't seem very important, but maybe it was the major food of another species. And maybe that one will then disappear. And maybe that was the major food. So, and so it goes on. And I see as these species disappear, it's like pulling a thread from the tapestry. And when enough threads are pulled, then the, the tapestry will hang in tatters. The ecosystem will collapse. And it's happened. It's happened already in some places. So Dr. Goodall, you know, I, I'm so I'm so sorry to cut you off. I, I I wanted to follow up more on that about you know as you as you watch look at this tapestry, it, it seems like as here in the United States, for example, people have been personally affected by climate change, flooding, fires. It it brings it from the theoretical to the personal. H how do we ha help us all understand the potential dangers, understand the danger of losing species without having to have it you know, be a flood in your community or a fire that ravages your home? Well, unfortunately, it seems that something like that is necessary to wake some people up. And, you know, for so long, people in the wealthy North have sort of thought, well, climate change, it's not affecting me. It's affecting Bangladesh and places like that. But, well, that's, that's not my problem. But now it's come home to roost. It's the fires that are that are all around the world raging and you know the weather patterns have changed everywhere think of the terrible hurricanes hurricane um, ida last week that terrible flooding the wind that swept through the flooding unprecedented in new york europe was flooded a lot of it and the, the hurricanes and the typhoons have got worse and so i think it probably was necessary for these fires and hurricanes and so on to affect the wealthy North so that people realize it's affecting us too. And that's what I hope will wake governments up if enough people get out there and really force governments to change the way they do things to protect the environment. So there are close to 8 billion people living on this earth and humans are constantly moving into spaces where animals live. What are the implications of those human wildlife interactions? And 
you know, what are the boundaries for an outsider to say to another community, you know, you need to do this or you need to do that? How, how do you have those conversations in a way that isn't, you know, seeming sort of um, like you're telling them what to do, which, you know, perhaps could, could be very unfair? It, it could indeed. But the way it, when it hit me was back in the late 80s. So when I first got to Gombe in 1960, it was part of the equatorial forest belt stretching right across equatorial Africa. By the late 1980s, when I flew over Gombe, I was shocked to look down on a little island of trees surrounded by bare hills. And there were more people living on that land than it could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, cutting down the trees in their desperation to grow more food to feed their growing families and struggling to survive. And that's when it hit me. If we don't do something to help these people find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, we can't save chimpanzees, forests or anything else. And so we began our Jane Goodall Institute program, Take Care of Tokari. And it wasn't a group of arrogant white people going into a poor village saying, you know, you've got to change your ways. It was a local a group of local Tanzanians and they went into the villages, 12 around Gombe, sat and talked to them, asked them what they thought we could do for them. Not talking about conservation at all to start with. And gradually we were able to gain their trust, um, improve the land, the overused farmland without chemicals, we were able to work with the Tanzanian government to improve health and education, introduce water management plans, uh, get scholarships to keep girls in school, because it's been shown all around the world as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. And so we got family planning information given by the local people who came to workshops. And th the people in these poor villages they've understood that the way out of poverty for their families is good education. They can't afford anymore to educate the eight to 10 children that used to be fairly normal back in 1960. So they welcome this information so they can plan out their families. And so we've even trained forest monitors to monitor the health of their forest. So all of these people have become our partners in conservation because they understand it. it's not just to protect wildlife, it's to protect their own future. They need the forests. We have an audience question. Our viewer, Julia Jorgensen from Texas, writes in to ask you this, Dr. Goodall. What do you view as the best international strategy for preserving wildlife habitats and reversing wildlife extinction? Well, I suppose um, <laughs> I would I would immediately say one thing about our Roots and Shoots program because we try to bring young people together from all around the world and partner with others. And these young people, not only are they going out and actually working to save species, but uh, to change their parents and grandparents. And some of them are already in government positions. And they're so globally, what can we do? understand that we are connected around the globe and you know the old saying that a butterfly flapping its wings in in brazil will affect people in america or whatever it was and that's really true so bringing governments together to make a plan and stick to a plan to protect wildlife but you know i'm not i'm not at all i can't answer all questions i can only do what, what I know I can do in, in my way. And it doesn't mean it's the right way, but it seems to have worked for us. <laughs> Many people do look to you for guidance. And I, I hear it, for example, on your Hopecast uh, podcast, people ask you a lot of questions. Do, do you have a sense of what it is about your work that, that connects people uh, and connects people to, to want to talk to you? 
I wish I could answer that question. I wish somebody could explain it to me. I was just a shy little girl growing up here, dreaming of going to live with wild animals. And, you know, and so I did the best years of my life out there with the chimpanzees in the forest. And then realizing they were vanishing, starting this crazy traveling around the world. And suddenly it happened that people started listening to me and, 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 it, I mean, how did I become this icon? I don't know. I just feel like me. I'm just me talking to you as an ordinary, just, I guess I've had a lucky life. I guess I've learned the right lessons. I guess the right path has been laid before me and I just had to make the right choices. But why people want to listen to me and take comfort very often, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I, I want to bring you back to the pandemic because it's something that we are all uh, thinking about along with climate change. Dr. Goodall, can, can you talk about the connection between encroaching on wildlife and, and the spread of diseases, especially as we look at diseases that could jump from animals to humans? What warnings do you have? Well, you know, the people studying these so-called zoonotic diseases have been warning us for years that a pandemic like this was inevitable. And, you know, it's it's partly, yes, moving into animal habitats, forcing some animals closer to people, which provides an opportunity for a pathogen like a virus to jump over. And when that happens, it might start a new disease. But there's also the trafficking of animals, hunting them, capturing them, trafficking them or their body parts around the world to sell in wildlife markets, um, for food, for medicine, exotic pets, they take their, their pathogens with them. And very often these wildlife markets are extremely unhygienic and it's relatively easy for a virus to jump over like COVID-19. But we mustn't forget our intensive animal farms too, the factory farms. There again, we're providing conditions that have led to many Diseases, not necessarily infectious, but disease jumping from animals to people. And, you know, these intensive animal farms, not only are oh, they terribly cruel, and we now know, science has finally admitted that animals are sentient, that they feel happy or they feel fear, they all feel pain. They're individuals with their own personality. We don't think of food animals like that, do we? But people are beginning moving to a plant-based diet, which saves huge areas of the natural world that at the moment are used to grow grain to feed the animals. And of course, all these animals produce methane gas in their digestion, which is one of the main greenhouse gases, along with CO2 and nitrous oxide. Well, connecting with that, we have an, another audience question. This from Jim Whitehead, who lives in Indiana, and asks, what is the one thing that would make the most difference for climate and sustainability efforts? Uh, Dr. Goodall, would you advise us to look at our own habits? Um, talk to us about what could what you see that could make a difference. Yes, well, as, as the Roots and Shoots um, motto is every one of us makes an impact every day some of us can make a much bigger difference than others depending on you know our state of um, wealth or position in life but if we start thinking about what we buy and how it was made and did it harm the environment or animals is it cheap because of forced labor unfair wages as these big corporations compete with each other to produce cheaper and cheaper goods so that they can get more and more custom. And it's a kind of terrible, vicious circle. But, you know, I was talking to the head of a big uh, corporation in Singapore just last week. And he said, you know, Jane, our company is totally changing. And for three reasons. One, we see the writing on the wall. We see that we cannot go on exploiting the, 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 the finite natural resources of the planet. They're not infinite. They're being used up. Secondly, there's consumer pressure. As people get more educated and more passionate, 
they're not buying things if we make them unethically, if we don't attend to our supply chain. But he said, the real thing came when my daughter came home from school and said, Daddy, is what you're doing affecting the environment? Because I'm going to have to live in it, aren't I, when I grow up? And he said, that got to me. And it's what I have felt as I've traveled around the world. People need to change from within. So good arguing with them, pointing fingers at them, screaming at them. Stories, tell them stories. Tell them stories which reach into the heart. Well, Dr. Jane Goodall, thank you so much. And thank you for talking to us about uh, your message of hope as well. I'd like to note you do have a book coming out next month called The Book of Hope, A Survival Guide for Trying Times. Thank you for joining us. What a privilege to speak with you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me on to your program. Thank you. Please stay with us. I'll be back with Wildlife Direct CEO, Dr. Paula Kuhumbu after this short video. Welcome back, I'm Libby Casey. My next guest is Dr. Paula Kahumbu, National Geographic Explorer and CEO of Wildlife Direct. Dr. Kahumbu, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you so much, I feel so privileged to be here. You, know, you focused your career on protecting animal wildlife in Kenya, especially elephants. So for our viewers who may not know, how did you first begin this work? And what made you realize there was a crisis that you could be part of solving? Well, I grew up in this phenomenal country full of wildlife and all I ever wanted to do was like Jane, go and live with the wild animals. And I started my PhD working on elephants in a tiny little uh, island forest in the south coast of Kenya. And in the middle of my work, I heard that the southern African countries, as well as Japan and China, wanted to open up the trade in ivory. I knew from my previous work with Ian Douglas Hamilton and Richard Leakey, that the previous uh, years, decades of ivory trade had decimated elephants across Africa and Asia. And I knew that it would be disastrous if we then reopened the ivory trade and it would have catastrophic effect on already, you know, populations that are just struggling to recover. So I wrote to Richard Leakey and I said, are you aware that this is happening? And he said, you have to drop your PhD, come and work for me for two years and help me. He made me the head of the CITES, that is the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species um, Office in Kenya Wildlife Service. And he asked me to develop a national position on this. And it was uh, an incredibly important moment in my life. I was very young, but I had this very important job to communicate to the world that elephants are not worth only their teeth because ivory is really literally there two incisors, that elephants are these extraordinary thinking, feeling, emotional, family-oriented animals that deserved to live just like human beings. Um, and it worked. We, we made a huge impact as Kenya for countries all around the world. Mm. You know, Jane Goodall talks about the importance of stories. So how have you balanced science with, with stories to help connect people to the wildlife that may be very far away or may be in their backyards? 
Well, uh, Jane is absolutely right. And I'm so lucky to be associated with National Geographic. And of course, through the award that I got earlier this year with Rolex and National Geographic, the Explorer of the Year Award, in recognition of the work I've been doing making wildlife documentaries. Uh, Libby, you'd be surprised to hear that although Africa has been the source of hundreds of documentaries made every year on our wildlife, which is serving a global community of environmental environmentalists and, of course, the environmental movement around the world. Those films made in Africa about our iconic animals are not really seen here in Africa. And uh, unable to get those films brought back in to the level that we need them to, to really catalyze an environmental movement in this continent, I decided to just start making my own wildlife documentaries. Today, my organization, Wildlife Direct, is the only organization in Africa, Africans making wildlife documentaries for Africans. And our TV series is called Wildlife Warriors. We tell the stories of our heroes and heroines at the front line, saving animals. You know, children, we have a little boy, his name was Richard Terere, who invented a device to stop lions from killing his father's livestock. Or a young man saving turtles, people at the front line of elephant conservation. These stories resonate with Africans because they involve us. And that is how we are changing mindsets and moving people to action. It's really quite phenomenal. Yeah, and you, as you point out, the, the viewers are Africans, but the creators are Africans too. Um, it, what are you learning from these local conservationists? You shared a couple of uh, small stories there, but, but how do they affect your work and how are you hearing it resonate in Kenya? Well, it, it's amazing. You know, the, the impact of my series is incredible. 51% of Kenyans have been watching it. And I get stopped on the streets by children who call their mothers over and say, please ask her, is that Paula? You know, they want to know who I am. That's phenomenal. It's affecting those people. But the more stories I look for, the more interesting and amazing opportunities arise. I was just watching one of my episodes for season two, which is about to come out. I went to the top of a mountain called the Loiter Hills. The forest is called the Forest of the Lost Child. It already sounds mysterious. And this forest, 2,000 square kilometers, is probably the last remaining ancient forest, tropical forest, rainforest in Africa, that is really managed by local people, by these elders who use the forest for their medicine. And what I learned from them after spending two weeks in the forest with them was that Without the forest, their culture is dead. They, they are so intimately intertwined with this forest, with the stories of the trees, with the medicines, uh, with their tradition and their religion. It, it really made me understand that as scientists, sometimes we've got it wrong. We think that numbers and statistics will tell us everything, but it's what's in our heart, as Jane said. It's what's in our heart that really pulls us and causes us to take action. So I, that's what I think was the most powerful lesson that I learned during the last season of filming. What is now the biggest threat to Kenya's wildlife? Well, I would say climate change, absolutely climate change. Kenya is one of the least emitters of uh, greenhouse gases, but we are affected by climate change in a very serious way. And it is exacerbated by uh, unsustainable land use patterns. If, if you go into the north of Kenya, you'll find people killing each other. I'm, I'm not kidding. We have an all, all out, you know, a firefight between different tribes. They're fighting over water. They're fighting over grass for their livestock because it's gone and it's gone because of climate change. So we're seeing desertification. And you know, as, as this happens, we see increasing poverty and poverty comes with greater dependency on the natural environment for your fuel, for your food, for your medicines. And so it's a very vicious cycle. So I would say climate change is by far the most important um, threat, um, but I do think that there are ways to reverse this. And who do you look to to take uh, take responsibility to reverse that? I mean, you talked about, you know, countries that may not be big emitters, but are bearing the, the brunt of that destruction. Who do you look to, to 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 really take charge of this? Well, our own leaders have to take a stand and they have to implement what they said, just as Jane mentioned earlier. 
our president, Uhuru Kenyatta, has been at the forefront of African nations speaking about the unsustainability of development, whether it's agricultural development, water exploitation, or industrial development, which is happening across the continent as our countries try to become more modernized. So our leadership needs to walk the talk, there's no question. But we also need to go and speak to the global leaders in the world. Um, I think that the, G, the COP26 is going to be a very, very important moment, and I hope that I can be there to speak to the world leaders about this issue. You know, Kenya alone cannot do much when the cause of the climate change is coming from far outside of our nation. We need help, as, as do all African countries. And if we don't take the actions, if we don't get the support we need, we stand to lose, it's not just iconic species, we stand to lose entire ecosystems and habitats, and we will have a level of impoverishment and suffering that will have never been seen before. We will see economic refugees flooding out of the African continent. It's in the interest of everyone to really ensure that we don't reach that planetary boundary, that we all take the actions now and that we work together and we listen to each other. Just as when I went to see the elders in the forest, I really understood their complaint, which was that, you know, we've been saving this forest for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. And you top big scientists, you come here and try to tell us things that we already know. We know far more than you. It's just that we don't know it in the same form of science. And I feel the same way. African countries need to have the confidence to stand up and speak out. And the rest of the world really has to start listening and has to start acting more responsibly because there's no country that doesn't depend on other countries. We are all affecting each other. You know, you've talked, Dr. Kahumbu, about growing up near so many animals and how not only are they just not as prevalent now, but some of them are on the endangered species list. It may seem obvious, but what do humans lose as wildlife dies out? Wow. Uh, what do we not lose? We lose we lose so much. I think we lose our humanity. Um, human beings are part of nature. We're not apart from nature. We are part and parcel of nature. And our relationship with nature is very important. And I think we see this a lot in terms of levels of stress, levels of depression around the world as people become increasingly disconnected from nature. And as we lose our our animals, we lose a part of ourselves. And I can say this because when people come to Kenya, we have over a million visitors come to our country every year to see the great wildebeest migration, to come and see our elephants, our lions, giraffes. And they stand out there in the savannah and they say, I don't want to go home. I feel like I'm at home now. And it's not surprising. As a species, we evolved. We co-evolved with all these other animals and plants and landscapes. So when we let it all go, we actually lose an important part of ourselves. On a very practical day-to-day -day level, we're also losing our life support systems. We cannot thrive without good quality air. We cannot thrive without water that's potable. We can't eat food that is contaminated and expect to thrive. And we've seen so much sickness around the world that is related to damage to ecosystems, the pollution and uh, infections and uh, poisons and chemicals, um, that uh, the only way to reverse it is through having healthy and resilient uh, ecosystems. And by that, I mean, you know, trees, soils, air, water, all of these things are interconnected. And when they work together, they can actually um, forestall so much of the damage. But when we start damaging and removing the trees, for example, we don't have any resilience against climate change, for example. When we remove mangroves, we have no resilience against storms that are coming in and thrashing our coastline. So I think, you know, there are so many um, different ways that we will suffer when we lose these species. And we've seen, you know, apart from practical things, there is a, there is a real sorrow in the, in the world right now. I sense it, that uh, there's real heartbreak. We have two remaining northern white rhinos in Kenya. Their names are Najin and Fatu. And when I filmed them, I saw how it affected my entire crew. We're witnessing 
a species on the brink of extinction. These two animals will be gone within the next few years. Uh, it's heartbreaking and, and it's not something that we even have the words or the language to articulate how it affects us, but it affects us very deeply. In the face of these challenges, what can the average person watching do to help with wildlife protection? You know, we've had a lot of viewers writing in to ask that question, what can I do? Well, that's wonderful and amazing that so many people want to help. I, um, I do a lot of work with children, schools, communities, uh, and of course with government and scientists and conservationists. Anybody anywhere in the world support organization in Africa or, or in any part of the world that, is, that are doing good work. So definitely do support where you can and go out and volunteer, as Jane said, getting yourself in the thick of it is a big part of um, our own transformation as people. We become so engaged in what we're doing and we want to do more and more. Here in Africa, what I really want to see in terms of a big change is the way that we tell our stories. We need to own these stories. And I mean, own the good, the great, the wonderful and the bad. We need to, t we need to uh, take responsibility for the damage that we are causing and we need to turn that around. We need to be proud of, of what we have. And so I'm, I'm looking for global partnerships to help us to, you know, catalyze the storytelling industry, film, digital, even press, journalism, so that we can have our own narrative about our wildlife and our nature that is linked to our cultures. You know, I talk about Africa like it's one country. It's not. It's hundreds of different languages and cultures and traditions. And, and none of those are really known by anybody else in the world. Imagine if how rich the world will be when we understand these intricate relationships. I think that we can do a lot more when we understand each other better and when we take a role in the stories that are being told. I think that will move people, it will inspire people, and it will cause people to demand better action from our governments. We are, we are all democratic nations across the continent. Our elections in Kenya are coming up next year, and we want to have an environmentally literate community and citizenry so that we choose well for our next level of leadership. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, so we'll have to leave things there. Dr. Paula Kahumbu, thank you so much for joining us today. This has just been fascinating to hear about your work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Dr. Jane Goodall for joining us today. For more stories on how people around the world are solving our climate challenges, check out the Washington Post's Climate Solutions Content Hub. That's at wapo.st slash climate solutions. And if you'd like to check out what interviews we have coming up, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and to find out more information about all of our upcoming programs. I'm Libby Casey. Thank you so much for watching.